While our speakers are stepping up to the podium, uh, just a quick introduction on, on this panel. So our first panel, we wanted to focus a, a little more closely on nearer term needs of uh, uh, labor markets and how immigration fits into that. Um, for our second panel, we wanted to take a sort of a longer term look on uh, demographic trends in our region. And we have a couple of great speakers uh, that we've invited uh, to, to speak uh, on that topic. Our first speaker is, is a repeat uh, performance uh, from, from last year's uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, conference. He was so great, we wanted to have him come again. And that's David Flynn, who's a professor and chair of the Department of Economics and Finance at the University of North Dakota. And one of the reasons that we, that we invited him to speak is he's also currently teaching a class on uh, demography at the University of North Dakota, which I understand is actually watching our live stream right now. So, so a virtual welcome uh, to all of his students who are, who are watching us today. Uh, if you could please help me uh, welcome Professor Flynn to the, the podium. Okay. Do I just, did I just click that before? Yeah. Okay. Yes, well, thank you very much. Um, uh, I'm very glad to be back, and I'm very happy that my, my class is watching today. Um, uh, I guess according to Dr. Allen, I would be the most miserable person in the room doing both economics and demography. Um, so uh, I, I guess that's, the, that's why I feel like I always have an optimistic outlook uh, having done both of them. But um, just some quick info, obviously North Dakota, largely rural state in a significantly rural fed district. Uh, it has until recently been a declining population state. Um, and if you didn't know, the Minneapolis Fed District is the third largest in land mass, but is the smallest in population. Uh, so there's some, some interesting rural urban dynamics that go on there. Economically diverse, we all know this, we can skip over some of these things. These are the things you put into a presentation not knowing if you're ever going to need them. Um, there are sectors with clear labor demand right now uh, within this industry, uh, within, within this sector. Uh, we're talking about energy, ag, uh, largely in North Dakota, and points west of Minnesota. Um, it's obviously the major growth sector, and it's creating indirect shortages in other countries, or sorry, other sectors of the economy. In particular, we're dealing with uh, you know, issues such as everybody take a job to the right. Okay, oh, this job is open, so I'll take that. That creates a need somewhere else. There's such a labor-constrained environment out there right now uh, that it's, it's very difficult to, to make long-run plans. Uh, it's leaving growth and development on the table uh, in the state of North Dakota, most likely in the state of, of uh, Montana, South Dakota. You're leaving opportunities uh, because you're not getting adequate growth in there. So how do you increase available labor? There's two conventional demographic models here. One is fertility, uh, and that has a lag issue. Okay, I mean that that's a <laughs> that's a 16-year solution to your to your labor shortage today, uh, and so you have to really look forward on on that kind of thing. Whether you uh, we can get into policy discussions about you know can you even effectively subsidize you know fertility and those types of issues you're still solving a problem 16 years down the road, and so you better really hope that you're dealing with that. And migration, both domestic and international, uh, would, be, would be the next, the next uh, set. And different implications, different lags. The rest of the country is now dealing with North Dakota's problem, all right? That is more job openings than, than unemployed people available to fill them. Um, and I hope the rest of the country has a better solution than North Dakota, because we haven't fixed it. All right, we still are dealing with something on the order of eight to 10,000 more job openings than unemployed people available to fill them. Uh, and so you know, as the region deals with that, as the country deals with that, this is, uh, this is something that, that is uh, a problem in need of a solution. Um, first best solution is something like wage increases. We've seen it work in North Dakota, particularly for the energy sector. As they start to pay whatever people are demanding, they got labor in, they got people in, uh, it was to the detriment of other sectors within the state, uh, and it was uh, you know, potentially uh, a, a short-run fix, not a long-run fix. Um, just some county population estimates. You can see the one hot spot in the whole district is, is obviously the Twin Cities. The change uh, in, in population is the same uh, kind of thing. The real hot spot is that district. Median age, um, I think this is a laser pointer. Yep, okay, so the median age. You can see that, that from the age profile, uh, the, the Western North Dakota, this is uh, Native American reservation uh, territory uh, as well. And, you know, the Twin Cities, uh, surprisingly, you know, with University of Minnesota and so many other universities here, 
uh, younger, but not as young as Western North Dakota, some of the oil counties and such. There's a real, there's a real concentration of youth in, in these various different sectors. Um, upper Peninsula of Michigan, obviously having some, uh, some issues as they're on the uh, upper age uh, scale there. Um, uh, for males you know, and females, it's, it's largely the same pattern as we, as we break it out by sex. Um, so the county uh, population born out of state. I should have mentioned this is the uh, every county in the Minneapolis Fed District. Okay, so this is this is every every county that's in that. So there's some uh, northern Wisconsin here, uh, Upper Peninsula of Michigan there. Those those kinds of things. Uh, and this is per thousand of population. And you can see uh, that uh, for Minnesota, it's quite a bit of the population is actually born out of the state. There's a lot of domestic and international migration in. Um, of late, you've seen the same kind of thing happening for the state of North Dakota uh, as well. Although there are pockets where you know, a significant portion of the population is simply uh, born in the state, this also correlates very highly to people who are living in the same county where they were born. Uh, and so there's, there's not a lot of, of this kind of migration uh, going on. Uh, Foreign-born population, we can see uh, even less going on. Uh, just a very few pockets of a significant amount of foreign-born population. The whole region actually is having uh, a similar experience when it comes to sorry, similar experience when it comes to the the attracting in uh, foreign immigrants. It's, it's the same rate per thousand of population wherever you are. Shows up in some different numbers uh, depending on the lower population counties in in North Dakota or, or uh, South Dakota, Montana. The net migration rate. 2011, uh, here's your sign that the oil economy was doing well. Uh, many, many people coming in. Uh, it stayed that way. In fact, you know, just getting ridiculously high. The, the rest of the region is essentially staying the same. It's oil country, North Dakota, that's doing really, really well into 12 and 13, 14 even. Uh, and then we, we hit 15, oil prices start to drop. It's still doing all right. And then we get a dramatic reversal. Now, every other one of these regions stayed the same, essentially. What happened was uh, oil country North Dakota went negative uh, and started to lose people. Uh, and this is the peril of this domestic migration, is that individuals are coming from Missouri, Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas. Uh, they're making uh, an incredible amount of uh, wealth for themselves. And they're free and flexible enough to return to wherever they were from. Many of them didn't bring families, left families at home, and just go back to them. Uh, and this is creating a problem for Bakken expansion part two, uh, where, where they still now have to bring in more workers and have these issues. Um, migration is the focus here. This, the topic of this one was long-run projections. Mortality experience is the same, staying the same, declining over time. Fertility experience, North Dakota's total fertility rate's on par with Utah right now, okay? Uh, we're, we're about the same. We've stayed right around replacement rate, much better than many other states around, around, the, uh, around the, the country. Uh, maybe a little bit of a gradual decline right now. I'll have a slide at the very end to, to sort of show what does work for, for fertility. But uh, in terms of international migration, you can see some pockets uh, around. This is a significant amount of Canadian inflow. Um, this is, uh, you've got, you know, pockets here and there around university towns and the like. Um, you, you don't actually notice a significant uh, international migration rate uh, around uh, the Twin Cities that's that much higher than the rest, confirming some of the earlier slides that we saw where this was just going down as a percentage. Where we see the, the interest in, in this region is in particular that domestic migration. So we had somebody identify as a recent domestic migrant, okay? Well, that seems to be, you know, the one thing that we had going for ourselves. Um, and unfortunately, it is easily reversible. And, and I've heard from countless employers, you know, the problems of getting people in. I had somebody work in this job for two, two weeks and they left because of the cold. Where were they from? St. Cloud. All right, so the, you know, the, 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 the weather in Grand Forks and St. Cloud can't be that different. And it can't be an unknown, okay? But, but it's like a very easy and convenient excuse. Um, and so, you know, again, just charting it through, getting, getting all of that workforce really coming from other parts of the United States. Um, and then, you know, and then again, the dramatic reversal uh, that goes on uh, as a result of that, okay? So little in the way of positive net international migration, and the outlook isn't much better right now. Uh, we, we're, we're not seeing that inflow really interested in this region at this time. 
Okay, and I think I think unfortunately there are a variety of national level issues that that come up around that uh, for for us. Um, it's obviously uh, a bigger response on the domestic front. People are responding to the fact that you could make $125,000 a year as a truck driver trucking oil out of Western North Dakota. Uh, I mean, wages work. Now that's an over-the-top number. Uh, I mean, that, that's an enormous number. Uh, of course, people are going to respond to that. There, there's no real subtlety uh, to, to that kind of a response. Um, the problem, again, being that these flows reverse very, very, very quickly. Um, so the conference is on immigration, so I didn't talk about fertility really that much here. But it does seem to be responding to economic events. Uh, I think that would be my overall assessment in, in terms of what we see at the state level in North Dakota. Good economic times are, are allowing fertility to at least maintain, if not expand, in some regions. Um, the interesting question that I don't think gets a lot of attention is that fertility increase due to recent in-migrants, domestic or international, if they're still having children at, at higher rates because of economic events drawing them in, but then they reverse and, and leave, then you get increases in birth that don't lead to long-run population growth. And that's been North Dakota's problem. With stable fertility uh, and migration falling, you know that people have to be leaving because the population was going down. Oil comes and changes that around. It's a significant number of 20 to 28 year old males who decide to leave when family formation activities start to start to become a priority. The, the sex ratio is out of out of balance in, in Western North Dakota in particular. But when I say economic events, this is this is the fertility rate in Williams County, which is where Williston, North Dakota is located. Uh, that's the blue series. Uh, I calculated that from the North Dakota Department of Health data. The red series is the oil price uh, per barrel, that is the North Dakota oil price per barrel. Um, and you can see that the, as oil takes off, uh, so does the fertility rate. Um, and so um, I, I'm trying to get this as a, as a paper to present in, in various places. And I, I won't share on air, but I've had various titles that, <laughs> well, I'll share one. I guess. If, if this band is rocking, it must have been in the Bakken. Um, and so, you know, you, you, see, you see that kind of response. So no amount of policy, I think, is going to allow you to overcome this. Uh, you know, market events drive everything. So the data is unclear. We haven't seen the wage changes. Uh, we get a lot of what I would classify as old man yelling at cloud arguments that, that were already mentioned. This manufacturer has been paying the same rate, wage for 50 years, and it was good enough then. Why isn't it good enough now? Well, it just isn't. Uh, responses are varying by region and industry. Oil is taking off and is willing to pay whatever it needs to get people in, and you don't see a response elsewhere. Uh, the general wage pressures, though, in a, place like, in a state like North Dakota are not evident uh, at this time, uh, so they should be able to do this. Uh, the national pot picture and policy is key. Wage pressures are leading to increases outside the Minneapolis Fed District, which means for states that are inside the Fed District, I have lots of concerns, particularly my home state of, of North Dakota. Uh, and so the, the fixed nature of the industries, too. We have extraction. We have little vertical integration going on at this time. That, that's another constraint on the growth and development opportunities that we have there. So thank you very much. Thank you, David, for that very quick run through, a lot of fascinating information. Uh, our, our next presenter uh, is, I think, a great compliment uh, to some of the presenters we've had already, and that is Allison Liuzzi, who's a senior, uh, she's a research scientist with the Wilder Foundation and the project director for Minnesota Compass, which is an excellent resource uh, we have in the state here around demographic, demographics, among other things. So if you could please welcome her. Good morning. Uh, my presentation focuses a little bit differently today on who actually are our immigrants in the in the ninth district and um, more specifically in Minnesota as mentioned I'm project director of Minnesota Compass and so um, my expertise is much more focused on this state um, but I do provide some background on on the entire district in this presentation as well let's see there we go so overview of my presentation today our communities have long been shaped by immigration I'll I'll sort of reiterate some of the stories that have already been told about looking back uh, about 100 years um, and how our foreign-born population here locally is really unique when we compare it to the national foreign-born population. 
Uh, we focus on Minnesota Compass on quality of life, and so when we look at some key quality of life outcomes, they look really different across our unique foreign-born populations. And then finally, when we think about the impact of immigration, it's not just today, but we're going to continue to see some of those impacts play out for generations to come. So let's start here. Our communities have long been shaped by immigration. Um, this really reiterates the point that Dr. Allen already made. 14% of our population nationwide is foreign born. When we look at the 9th Federal Reserve District, that varies widely from 2%, about 1 in 5 residents, or 1 in 50 residents um, in some of the states and regions in this district, all the way up to 9% in Minnesota, or about 1 in 10 residents here locally. This again sort of shows what share of Minnesota's population was foreign born back in the late 1800s. As many as one in three of our residents were foreign born. Today we're at 9%, lower than the national average, but again worth backing things up about 100 years um, to really consider how Minnesota was shaped by immigration. If you like roller coasters, a lot of my slides, a lot of my graphs are going to look like roller coasters today. Um, this is looking at things numerically. So back in the early 1900s, we reached a peak of foreign-born residents at more than half a million foreign-born residents in Minnesota. We're approaching another peak, so we've got that roller coaster going on, but a much lower percentage of our overall population because our native-born population has grown much more quickly. Um, and focusing in on a subset, I know we talked a little bit about refugee populations earlier in today's program. Um, this looks at a measure of primary refugee arrivals per 100,000 residents, so sort of standardizing it by the size of a state's population. And what you can see is that Minnesota, North Dakota, and South Dakota are among the top 10 states for primary refugee arrivals uh, last year in 2017. What do I mean by primary refugee arrivals? These are folks who come from their country of origin or from a refugee camp directly to that state, as opposed to secondary refugee arrivals who might originally arrive in a different state and relocate um, to Minnesota, South Dakota, North Dakota, for example. Focusing in specifically on Minnesota's refugee arrivals, this sort of shows peaks and valleys over time over the last 15 years or so. Minnesota was among the top five states numerically for uh, refugee arrivals between 2004 and 2007, largely because of very large um, arrivals from Somalia. You can see that over time, we sort of hovered around two to 3,000 refugee arrivals and then dipped back down to 920, um, the second lowest number of refugee arrivals we've seen since 2002. Most of our refugee arrivals here locally today are from Somalia and Burma. Um, about half of them are kids, and the majority of them settle in Ramsey County, so um, the county where, where St. Paul is. Our foreign-born population here is unique. So when we look um, nationally, the largest share of our foreign-born population was originally from somewhere in Latin America, but broken out into the different states and regions in this district, none of them necessarily are Latin America except for South Dakota. We kind of have ties in some states in terms of what the largest share, um, where the largest share originated from in terms of region, um, but Asia tends to be the country of origin for most of our um, populations of foreign-born residents. And this looks really different when we compare Minnesota and the U.S. We have similar proportions of our foreign-born residents coming from Europe, New Zealand, Australia, Northern America, which really mostly means Canada. And this is not my joke originally, but um, as a, a colleague used to say, those uh, immigrants from Canada are really the only ones who immigrate here for the weather. Um, <laughs> so similar shares there. Um, in terms of the share from Asia, we've got 37% here in Minnesota compared to 31% uh, nationally, and here's where we really see a big deviation. Half of our foreign-born population, again nationwide, is from Latin America compared to 22% in Minnesota, and here's another big deviation. 5% from Africa nationally, 28% in Minnesota, and that share continues to grow. And this really speaks to, again, another roller coaster. This looks back at countries of origin over time in Minnesota of our foreign-born population. 
back in the late 1800s, early 1900s, we were looking at large numbers of immigrants from Germany, Norway, Sweden. Today, we're looking at immigrants from Mexico, Somalia, Vietnam, um, Hmong immigrants, Indian immigrants. So a very big change in the countries of origin in terms of our foreign-born population. Quality of life outcomes. What do we see when we look at our foreign-born population uh, in terms of quality of life? Well, in Minnesota, about three-quarters of all of our adults are working. So as a measure of employment, 77% of adults are working. This is second in the nation next to North Dakota. Among our foreign-born residents, 73%. So not really large differences. This is statistically significant in terms of a difference, um, but not a huge difference. But when we break it out into countries of origin, we actually see quite wide differences. So 83% of our Canadian immigrants are working compared to 64% of our Hmong immigrants. Poverty, about one in 10 Minnesotans live below the poverty level. About 18% of our foreign born residents live below the poverty level. And again, really wide variation. 43% of our Somali residents, all the way down to 3% of our Indian residents. Median household income, just over 68,000 statewide. For foreign-born headed households, it's 55,000, so about 13,000 less. But again, wide variation, really wide variation on this. Over $100,000 for Indian headed households, um, down to about 20,000 for Somali headed households. And then finally, home ownership. One of the avenues toward accumulating wealth, 72% of uh, folks in Minnesota own their home, 47% among our foreign-born residents, so less than half. But again, we see that wide variation from 79% among Vietnamese-headed households down to 10% among our Somali households. So given that foreign-born populations are an increasing share of our population, it's really important to think about how that community is going to continue to shape our communities for generations to come. And this is where we focus on the kids of immigrants. We have first-generation immigrants who come into the state. And so, for example, um, since 2010, Minnesota has experienced a net gain of 71,000 residents due to migration. We've already talked about how that has everything to do with people coming in from other countries. We actually lost residents to other states. So all of that gain is due to um, folks coming in from other countries. But then we need to think about second generation and third generation immigrants. So this breaks our state, Minnesota, into fine age categories from zero to four at the bottom up to 85 plus at the top. The purple lavender portion of the bar shows the number who are native born. The red portion of the bar on the outside shows the number who are foreign born. And you can see that red portion kind of peaks right there in the 30 to 54 age categories. But what I really want you to pay attention to is that green portion. These are native children who have at least one foreign born parent. Okay, so this is what we could call a second generation immigrant. When you add them together with foreign born children, what we learn is that in Minnesota, about one in six kids is a child of an immigrant. So this is really important to think about the ways that this is going to play out in terms of our educational institutions. 16% of kids in public K-12 education speak a language other than English at home. Okay? In your mind, I want you to think about how many different languages are spoken in the homes of Minnesota's kids. Got a number? Okay. Mine is higher. I almost guarantee it, 260 different languages and dialects are spoken in the homes of Minnesota's K-12 kids. So when we think about our public education system as a sort of critical feature in making sure that we have a robust economy, that speaks to some of the challenges that we have in front of us. With that, I'll go take my seat and I'm ready for questions.
Thank you, Allison. Uh, just as we did with the last panel, we're going to have a couple of mic runners taking questions from the audience. But if I could just kick things off uh, with a question for both or either of you. Um, and just by way of teeing it up, I want to put a quick plug in for an article that was distributed in your packet that everyone in the audience has received uh, about a, a visit that President Kashkari made to Worthington, Minnesota last summer. Um, a place that's seen uh, really dramatic uh, change and growth uh, over the last generation, uh, largely due to international migration uh, to Worthington. And um, what I'd like to ask about is, are there any particular trends or differences that you could point to between uh, rural areas like Worthington um, or uh, certain parts of Huron, South Dakota is another example of a community that's received a lot of international migration. Can you identify any of those particular areas and maybe key differences between uh, those rural areas that are sort of hot pockets of international migration and, uh, and large urban areas in our region? Well, I, Please. Um, I, I think a, a couple of interesting things occur with that. One is that I think some of these rural areas that have been accepting of international migrants have realized that domestically they weren't going to cut it. It, it, was, it was adapt or die. Uh, as a community, and so they needed to to be more welcoming. Uh, I think the urban areas, at some level, are more welcoming because they're already more diverse. But I think the 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 rural areas have that have done this and have been successful at it have recognized it's a matter of necessity. It's not a matter of choice anymore. Yeah, I would I would piggyback on that and say some of the barriers um, that we see for immigrant communities in terms of sort of getting integrated into a community can look different in rural and urban areas. So I think urban areas, we see one of the key barriers is transportation, access to transportation. In rural areas, it can be some of those cultural um, aspects that we already talked about. Thank you. Anything particularly attractive about rural areas in your experience? Or, I, yeah. I think, generally speaking, that it, it's uh, uh, employment. Uh, employment based that there's you know better use of skills mm -hmm. it's 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 almost a pre-screened match to some level better than some of the urban areas okay David I had a question just to kind of follow up on some of the data that you showed um, obviously one of the themes in your in, in your slides was that while there was a lot of migration to the Bakken oil patch uh, it was it was all, nearly all domestic in migration from other states um, during the during the oil boom, any theories on why we didn't see more international migration to the oil patch during that time? Well, I, I think I think a couple of things. I think one, um, it it was where the companies were looking uh, for workers. Um, if you look at the the county to county uh, worker flow, uh, it was a significant amount of Missouri, Kansas, Oklahoma, and Texas. And so I think what you had was a lot of companies that had oil experience knew where they could find and tap workers, whether already in the company or, or just knew where the workers were. And so we're able to put out that kind of uh, uh, ad and, and knew where to, get, where to target. Okay. Any questions from the audience? Uh, we have one right up front here. My name's Deborah Boltnick. Um, my husband and I lived in the Bakken region for a few years, taking advantage of the oil field careers. And to comment on your question about um, perhaps why more foreign-born migrants didn't make that switch, um, North Dakota. I loved living there, by the way. I, I love North Dakota. So we lived in Tioga, mm -hmm. and um, the culture there wasn't necessarily as welcoming to uh, foreign populations as, as they would be in other places. And so I think there was pushback, not necessarily from the North Dakotans, but people were, came from everywhere, and a lot of them came from the southern states, as you mentioned, and there was a little pushback on that. I, I think there was cultural assimilation issues across the board uh, in, in that regard. Compound it with things like a housing crisis and everybody competing for scarce resources. It's weird to think of housing as a scarce resource in that kind, of, but that was really the case. And so, I mean, I think there was a lot of social stress, no matter what dimension you wanted to look at, that would make that kind of experience problematic.
while we get to our next questioner, Allison, I just had a quick question for you about the the, the, the composition differences in, in nation of origin uh, uh, among immigrants in Minnesota versus the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if that is something that you see continuing uh, into the future or perhaps changing, and if so, how? Yeah, I, I think I would expect our region to continue to stand out from the nation. I mean, in part, we're not located along the southern border, and so that's going to influence things. But I think especially because three states in the region have been so welcoming of refugees, that's had a huge impact on the ways that our communities have taken shape over time. And so I suspect that um, Asian populations will continue to form a large portion of our foreign-born population. And especially in Minnesota, our African-born population is going to continue to, to climb. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a question from this gentleman. Hi, my name is Tom. I'm a nursing student at Housing University. Um, I have a question for Allison. Um, some of the graphical presentation you showed um, on uh, especially the housing and uh, those who are below the poverty line for the immigrants. I saw there was a large deviation between the uh, Somali immigrants and uh, others who are from, for example, the Vietnam and uh, these other countries like India. So uh, for the research that you've done, have you, uh, do you have any like suggestions or reasons as to why we have that big gap between the Somali population and these other people? Is it the level of education or uh, uh, difficulty accessing resources or what do you think? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. I think one of the key factors is length of time in the U.S. Our Somali population of immigrants tends to have been here for a shorter period of time. Um, and so when we look at key outcomes on things like employment, um, on average, it takes about 11 years. Once, once immigrants have been in the country 11 years or more, we tend to see equivalent levels of employment. Um, but before that, we see lower levels of employment among our foreign-born population compared to our native-born population. And so since our Somali-born population has been here in general a shorter uh, period of time than, for example, our Vietnamese population, um, or our Hmong population, um, we see some of those outcomes that haven't quite caught up yet. That said, I think there are key barriers um, that we could be working on in terms of access to credit, transportation, um, being able to sort of navigate paths to things like home ownership, uh, the educational system that we could be actively working on to sort of shorten that period of time that it takes to see better outcomes. We have another question from Diana. I'm wondering if you um, have information on um, the number of refugees who are coming to Minnesota uh, or the upper Midwest after they've settled someplace else in the country. You talked about the mm -hmm. first, uh, Minnesota being their first place of origin, yeah. but I hear anecdotally that people are coming to Minnesota because they find it welcoming from other places in the country. Yes, yeah, and th that's true. Um, the most recent data I have comparing Minnesota to other states is from 2013, so it's dated at this point. But in 2013, Minnesota received more than double the number of secondary refugees of any other state in the nation. Um, the Minnesota Department of Health does keep some statistics on, on refugees, on secondary refugee arrivals as well, and so we do know some things about the, that population. Um, we tend to receive secondary refugee arrivals from Texas, from Florida, from California, um, and Minnesota remains a desirable place. We have communities that are welcoming here for both primary and re secondary refugees. Yeah. Over here. Hi, I had introduced myself earlier. I'm Kelsey Waits. Um, I'm a student at the Humphrey School, but I am also a school board member in Hastings. And so as we're looking at um, one in six students in Minnesota um, being from foreign-born parents, Hastings does not have that number yet, but as we look at our demographics, we can see it is changing, and it is um, the speed at which it is changing is increasing. And so my question would be, what role can schools play or what sort of investments can schools make in order to make these experiences and the welcoming atmosphere for these um, children of immigrants and for the immigrant community? That's a, it's a big question. <laughs> um, and I am not an educator. 
Um, and I, I'm not an educator of children, I should say. Uh, so, <laughs> um, there, there are lots of things that we can do both on an individual level in our one-on-one -on -one interactions, all the way up to things that we could do at a more systemic level. Um, and I think all of those things kind of need to be happening at once. Um, and so, you know, if you are a teacher, the ways that you're interacting with your students um, and with the parents of your students may need to adjust. Um, the, you know, some of the language that we use around sort of our country and they are coming here can be adjusted, so some of the narrative that we're using, um, but also some of the systemic barriers. Like I said, 260 different languages and dialects. What are we doing um, to, to try to address some of the challenges associated with that? Um, how are we equipping teachers in the classroom to be able to communicate with parents who speak potentially different languages, are coming from different cultures, have different cultural ways of communicating. Um, so lots of sort of layers to that question. Mm -hmm. All right, I think we have time for one more question. Hi, Ryan Allen from the University of Minnesota. Um, my question I think is most germane to Allison, but I'd, I'd be curious that David's response to this as well. In the last year of the Obama presidency, the ceiling for refugees was at, set at 110,000. The most recent uh, ceiling is 30,000. And com combined with the travel ban, which has taken Somali migration off of the table for the United States, it seems to me that's going to have a disproportionate effect, uh, particularly on our states, given the data that Allison showed. Um, what do you see as the short-term and long-term implications of those decisions? If you want to go first. Oh. <laughs> um, well, I, I, I've been talking. I think at this point, it's a, it, it's a matter of uh, any, any constraints are problematic. Uh, and the, the population growth in North Dakota is, is still, you know, the domestic migration I would not count as permanent migration necessarily. The international migration tends to be longer standing and therefore more integrated. And so those kinds of bans, those kinds of caps uh, are, are going to somewhat hurt the growth potential for the population. And I would sort of reiterate that point. I mean, in Minnesota, estimates vary, but we're staring down a workforce shortage of 100,000 plus workers in the next 10 years or so. And so, I mean, whether you look at that as a short-term impact or a long-term impact, um, you know, the extent to which we're sort of constricting flows of folks into our state is going to have economic impacts. All right, with that, if we could please express our gratitude to our speakers today.